Hi everyone, my name is Austin, and, after, and I am back after doing my review for Ed, Ed, and Eddie, after which I let Jeremy do a review. And, uh, well, here's the result of that. According to Julianne Moore, the character of Maud was inspired by artist Car Carolee Schneeman, who, much like Austin's first wife, Helen, worked naked from a swing. When it came time for the Coens to write the screenplay, they only came up with around 40 pages, letting it marinate until it was time to finish it, which really isn't anything new and is a very common tradition, usually reaching a fork in the road, often moving on to another project before coming back to what they were originally working on. And by that point, they've already cooked up ideas for future films which Austin should consider doing with his reviews so that they're ready for filming each month. Maybe even next week if possible. Because you generally are going to have those actors who are very self-conscious. Trust me, Austin is like that. Chris Tucker was busy in a film that Austin may cover in the future. Yeah. Those are the consequences for letting someone else do your own review show instead of yourself. You get, some, get made fun of, and you generally get a lot of ideas for other reviews that maybe you'll do, maybe you won't do. Anyway, today I'm going to do a movie review, but it's for a film that, honestly, up until now, I think I've had the least interest in covering on the show, but it's a sequel to a movie that I reviewed before. In fact, it was the first movie I ever reviewed. And that is today's subject. Ladies and gentlemen, Escape from L.A. Directed by John Carpenter and starring Kurt Russell once again as Snake Plissken. And yes, this is the sequel to Escape from New York. So, without further ado, let's talk about it. Escape from L.A. can be best described like this. In 2000, a massive earthquake hits the city of Los Angeles, which ends up getting cut off from the mainland as the San Fernando Valley floods. Not unlike my inbox after I say, send me pictures of Ash Ketchum dressed as John Wick. Send them to this address here. Using the fear of God and stating that he is punishing Los Angeles for its supposed sins, uh, excuse me, a theocratic presidential candidate wins the election and ends up having a lifetime term in office. And this is why we should not let televangelists run for president, kids. It never ends well. Said president then orders the that the U.S. Capitol will be changed from Washington, D.C. to his hometown of Lynchburg, Virginia, and begins placing certain morality laws, including the banning of smoking, alcohol, drugs, premarital sex, firearms, profanity, and red meat, violating the First and Second Amendments, bringing back prohibition, reminding me why the Supreme Court is clinically brain dead, and the banning of red meat is just dumb, reinforcing the prohibition idea. Anyway, those who violate said laws are then given two choices lose U.S. citizenship and serve a life sentence in, on the Los Angeles island, or repentance and death by electrocution. Because I guess the guillotine and burnings at the stake and all hangings were banned as well, despite being pretty fitting for a theocracy. A giant wall is placed around the mainland shore, and heavy federal police mock presence monitors the area ensuring that escape is near impossible. By 2013, the U.S. has created a superweapon known as the Sword of Damocles, usually referred to as an allusion to the imminent and ever-present peril faced by those in power. You can look it up for more information. A satellite that essentially renders all electronic systems anywhere in the world as useless as a wet noodle against a tiger with the president intending to use it to rule the world by ensuring that all hostile nations don't function. At all. 
The president's daughter, Utopia, then steals the remote control for the system and escapes to Los Angeles Island to give it to Cuervo Jones, a Peruvian Shining Path revolutionary who marshaled invasions of third world nations and intends to attack the US. So to put it lightly, the earthquake occurred three years after Escape from New York, which took place in an ultra in 1997, and Escape from LA takes place 16 years after the previous film in a very dystopian 2013. Needless to say, the one we got was much better. Especially for me. But that's another story. Anyway, facing deportation for some crimes, our man Snake Plissken is given an opportunity for a pardon to get on, on the island and get the remote back after a previous team failed to do so. And in a very familiar scenario, Snake is injected with a virus that will kill him in 10 hours with the promise of a cure if he succeeds, with the president not caring if Utopia makes it back alive, regarding her as a traitor. And that's pretty much Escape from LA in a nutshell. The same setup as the original, just different circumstances and goals in mind. Nothing more, nothing less. Can't go wrong with that. Now then, let's see how this film got made. Escape from LA's production started back in 1987, when Coleman Luck, a writer for The Equalizer, was commissioned to write a screenplay for the film with Dino De Laurentiis, a producer whose credits are so vast that you just need to see to believe it, which John Carpenter felt was too light and too campy. Kind of ironic considering what he gets, but I'm getting him, so. Years later, Carpenter and Kurt Russell got together alongside Deborah Hill, who really produced a lot of films in her lifetime, whether it be on the first three Halloween films, The Fog, and Escape from New York with Carpenter, or films like The Dead Zone, which I love, Clue, Adventures in Babysitting, and The Fisher King. With our man John stating that his boy Kurt was persistent in making this film a reality, because Snake Plissken was a character he loved and wanted to play him again which at the same time gave Russell the motivation to do the script where he came up with and wrote the entire ending of the movie in what is currently the actor's only writing credit. Some sources even claim that when the 1994 North Bridge earthquake hit Los Angeles, it gave Carpenter and Russell an opportunity to put in elements of earthquakes, floods, mudslides, and drive-by shootings. The Dark Side of L.A. President in this film was another idea of Russell's, being patterned off of, speaking of televangelists who are glad Worm elected the president, Pat Robertson, of which Cliff Robertson, no relation, was cast as was cast as the president, as sadly Donald Pleasance couldn't return to his presidential role due to being really ill at the time, and sadly died on February 2nd, 1995, just a year before the film's release. Moving toward the filming, Carpenter has noted how, how he worked nights upon nights of work, but he had, but had plenty of fun making the film, with one rather interesting night being that during the filming at Disneyland, I mean Happy Kingdom, which was, which was filmed on a universal backlot, in fact it's actually the town square in Back to the Future, Rick Disco Duck D's issued a noise complaint, which forced the crew to cease usage of live ammo. When regarding the special effects, CG supervisor David Jones described it as being a little iffy, something that probably isn't helped by the fact that VFX company Buena Vista Visual Effects had no experience with computer graphics, but again, I'm ahead of myself. Meanwhile, in an uncredited position during filming, the Birdman himself, Tony Hawk, and fellow skateboarder Chris Miller said that they were stunt doubles for Kurt Russell and Peter Fonda during the surfing scene, which makes me sad that Superman isn't in this knowing that they're trivia. Many scenes were shot in Carson, California, such as the scenes in Sunset Boulevard and, some, and during some freeway, freeway sequences with the former being done in a landfill, 
where the production staff developed over 120 structures to create a shanty town, along with 29,000 pieces of rubble, and to give it the illusion of a crowded post-apocalyptic freeway, 250 cars were brought in from a junkyard in Ventura, with production lasting three months from December 1995 to February 1996, and Russell receiving a paycheck of $10 million, with the budget costing about $50 million overall, which is just $44 million than its predecessor shot. And with that, Let's get to what I think about this film, because I have some thoughts. I'll be honest with you. When I did my review for Escape from New York just four years ago, three years in terms of air date order, I hadn't seen nor had any interest in seeing the sequel, mostly mentioning toward the end that the film didn't do well critically or financially, complete with a picture of Jay Sherman of the critic proclaiming, IT STINKS! Uh, excuse me. And in the years since, I didn't bother touching it because I didn't care enough to want to do it, as Escape from New York was friggin' sweet. And it's still an awesome movie after nearly 43 years. In fact, I even watched it for this review. And yeah, still holds up since that first review, even if things have improved since. Not to mention, makes for a great triple feature with Blue Thunder and Robocop. I like it! it wasn't until I found a copy of the DVD for Escape from LA at a thrift store that I decided to take a chance on it, as all I had seen up to that point was the trailer and nothing more. So I went in with optimistic yet cautious expectations. And well, I certainly came to a conclusion. The facts of the case are this. Escape from LA isn't as good as it could have been. It's not a bad film by any stretch of the imagination, but when you compare it to its predecessor, it's no competition what the superior film is here. Call me Snake. I'm too tired. Maybe later. Let's start with the big one here. The tone is drastically different than the first film, as while the first film had this grim, foreboding atmosphere with a setting located in what was once a prosperous city in America, and a dark tone throughout, this film has a tone that, at times, feels almost comedic, comical, and silly in nature. Abandoning th the things that made Escape from New York stand out 15 years prior, this to me is a double-edged sword, as while I was able to get acclimated to the goofier tone and sometimes cartoonish moments uh, that perpetuate the film throughout, it also is very jarring when you factor in how the original film was John Carpenter's answer to the Watergate scandal, and how Death Wish was the template for how the director wanted New York to be portrayed as the sort of hellhole that would happen if a national landmark became a dystopian super prison. It's a drastic departure from the, the original film, and something I really don't love all that much, despite being all for the sort of campiness that can be found in a Grindhouse-style film, and accepting it as such. But what is even more cringeworthy are the special effects, because Jurassic Park, this is not. What the hell were you thinking? When you compare it to Escape from New York, which isn't too effects heavy, but still has some nice practical effects that still hold up quite well in the grand scheme of things, then look at the CGI that Escape from LA has, nothing compares to what was used previously. While there is the occasional practical effect that works, the CGI is bad. Looking as fake as the ID that John McClane spots when investigating the body of Tony, and often looking like the first draft of something that would be refined as production went on. At the same time, it also feels appropriate given how ridiculous the film is, making it terrible, but in a way that's enjoyable. Again, a double-edged sword. It's fun, but also not good. Very all over the place, yet there's something here and that makes it watchable somehow. But even with the off-putting switch in tone and crappy effects, 
there are some things that do keep this movie from being one of the worst movies in John Carpenter's filmography. Just a weak one that is entertaining anyway. To start, the production design is really good, with the Los Angeles island feeling exactly like you think it would. A post-apocalyptic dystopian prison that at one point was the city where dreams were made and crushed. And the building where all the sentences are issued, feeling very authoritarian regime-like, showcasing how much control has been placed over the country over time. The production design was performed by Lawrence G. Paul, who has worked on films like Blue Collar, Blade Runner, Romance in the Stone, Back to the Future, Project X, 1987 film with Matthew Broderick, Helen Hunt, and a Monkey, not the 2012 teen sex comedy, which I might cover someday. Predator 2, City Slickers, Unlawful Entry, and Naked Gun 33 The Final Insult. And it really does look like a very dark future, which meant he did his job, and did so with finesse. The movie is also well shot, as well as the cinematography wasn't done by Dean Cundy, as he and Carpenter haven't worked together on anything big since Big Trouble in Little China, it was done by the late Gary B. Kidd, who shot Prince of Darkness, They Live, In the Mouth of Madness, Carpenter's version of Village of the Damned, Vampires, and Ghosts of Mars. And it is really good here. It's very dynamic and makes the locations pop quite well, not to mention makes some of the effects more tolerable but that could also be due to how the light is. The acting is also very fitting for this film, with Kurt Russell once again selling the role of Snake Plissken 15 years later. My name's Plissken. As Snake, Russell is gruff, brooding, and really doesn't care about what's going on, mostly doing stuff to try to survive in a world that can tear you a new asshole in a matter of seconds. He's still got it, and certainly makes the most film watchable as a result. You also have Steve Buscemi as Matt to the Stars Eddie, a swindler who sells an interactive tour guides and one of the assistants to the big bad Cuervo Jones. This town loves a winner. If Buscemi's Donnie was essentially him playing a nice guy who was not long for this world, then this is the actor playing a total sleaze that somehow survives at the end while at the same time filling in the role of Ernest Borgnine's cabbie from the previous film. And it works, as the actor sells the role right out of the gate, complete with enough smooth talking that you can't help but wonder, how does this guy sell this stuff? Especially for $50,000. You must be out of your goddamn mind! Buscemi is great here, just as he is in almost every other film he's in. Stop yelling at me! You also have Peter Fonda as a character called Pipeline, who's essentially the surfer dude who might as well be Peter Fonda himself because it's so him. This feels like everything the actor stood for in the 60s, an icon of the counterculture movement which changed the face of the earth from that point on, complete with a long hair and mellow attitude, possibly after rolling a joint or taking some LSD. That's Peter Fonda for you, And it works. Plus, he also makes the most of the so-bad-it's-good nature of the surfing stuff. You also have Cliff Robertson as the President of the United States, who apparently goes under the name President Adam, from what I read, who, if Donald Pleasance's portrayal of the President, was one who was grateful for Snake rescuing him, but showed no respect for those who assisted Snake in the rescue, namely Kathy, Brain, and Maggie, and had a firm grip on reality, then this dude is straight up Greg Stilson, a complete nut who should never have been given power at all. This isn't just the opposite of Uncle Ben, this is Uncle Ben's killer. For he so loved his country, he gave his only seditious child. And Robertson is great here as this nut job president who that feels pretty much like Kenneth Copeland in terms of of his personality. He probably also tricks several other people into giving him money by saying God will fix everything and doctors are unnecessary before becoming president as well. There's also Valeria Colino, Susanna and Rain Man, and Romada and Hot Shots films, as Taslima, a woman who is deported for, Mus- for her Muslim faith 
and essentially Caesar Hubley's character from the first film. Which, for those unaware, excuse me, Caesar Hubley, an actress best known for appearances in films like Hardcore and Vice Squad, appears in Escape from New York as a random chick snake meets an abandoned chock full of nuts, a coffee shop that later spawned its own brand based out of New York City. Sadly, he engages in conversation with Snake, and just when you think she's going to be here throughout the film, she gets killed by an, a group of crazies by being dragged into the floor to who knows what fate had in store for her. Tazima also ends up similar to Maureen. Who was Hubley's character's name, according to some things I read? In fact, Donald Pleasance's president's name was known as John Harker as I was reading for research. As while the former doesn't get dragged beneath the floor, she is however shot in a drive-by, thus cementing her fate as most likely to seem important only to die sometime in the story before anything happens. Galino does certainly make an impression though, mostly with a wig, a wig that is hard to forget, and she does the, make the most of the, with the time given. The other actors also handled their roles very well, including Stacey Keach as Commander Mac Malloy, who fills in Lee Van Cleef's Bob Hobb from the first film, Pam Greer as the transgender former associate of Snakes, of Snakes, Hershey Lama, La pa Las Palmas, formerly Jack Carjack Malone, and fills in the shoes of both Bri Brain and Maggie, George Corafase as Cuervo Jones, this film's version of the Duke of New York, Michelle Forbes as Lieutenant Brazen, functioning as both Raimi and the Vice President from, from the first film, and A.J. Langer as Utopia, the President's rebellious daughter and almost a fill-in for Don Pleasance's previous president, even if she's not the one Snake has to save. Oh, and Bruce Campbell plays the Surgeon General of Beverly Hills, who, for a short moment in the film, creeps you out along with all of his other victims, bringing back the dark vibe of Sneak's previous adventure for just one scene. And being Bruce Campbell, he makes it work. In fact, his makeup is almost a rejected concept from when Ash's face changes form during Army of Darkness, during the book scene, which probably made Sam Raimi be like, damn, Son of a bitch beat me to it. Make sure to keep on the lookout for Peter Jason as duty as the duty sergeant Snake talks to on, during the beginning when he's brought in, eating Raul's is Paul Bartel as a congressman, Jeff Imada as Modo Delessandro, Saigon Shadow, Brecken Meyer as a surfer, Robert Carradine who the 2000s kids will know as the title characters of Father and Lizzie McGuire, but all the 80s kids know as Louis Skolnick in Revenge of the Nerds, as a skinhead, and Leland Orser, Lucien DeBanco in ER, and Sam Gilroy in the Taken films, as Test Tube, the hacker who tells us just how powerful the Sword of Damocles is. Another great thing about Escape from LA is that much like its predecessor, it is well paced, never staying on, staying for too long and getting to the point as soon as possible. Which considering it takes, it runs two more minutes than it, the first film, that's adequate for this kind of movie. Finally, the soundtrack is awesome. Just, it's so awesome, with the score feeling pretty accurate in the first film, while also standing on its own, on, on its own feet. Carpenter returns to do the score, but instead of Alan Howarth, like the first film, the late Shirley Walker, who did the music for Batman the Animated Series, the first three Final Destination films, plus also worked with Carpenter on Memoirs of an Invisible Man, co-composed the score with the director. The score works very well, and fits every moment in the film, not to mention showcasing the talents of both Carpenter and Walker, with Walker's pieces feeling especially reminiscent of her previous work doing Batman the Animated Series. But then you also have the other soundtrack, and that one slaps, man. 
filled with a lot of industrial rock and alternative metal through tracks throughout. You've got Stabbing Westward, you've got Tool, Butthole Surfers is on here, Sugar Ray shows up, Ministry makes an appearance, and even Death Tones is on the soundtrack. And, <laughs> and it, man, it rocks. But by far the best song on the soundtrack is White Zombies is the One, which was specifically written for the film and was even used in the movie's theatrical trailer. And it is the bomb. Excuse me. Especially since this was the band in their prime prior to breaking up two years later, while Rob Zombie, continue, Rob Zombie still continues to be a cool musician even now. So yeah, the soundtrack definitely is the best part of the movie, and is pretty much what saves it from being just, just a complete disappointment, proving how the power of music can elevate a film, especially when you got White Zombie on there. But overall, Escape from LA is okay. It's an okay film. Enjoyable, but just okay when compared to Escape from New York. Escape from LA had its release on August 9th, 1996, and like I mentioned, had a budget of $50 million, compared to Escape from New York's whopping $6 million, which was a significant boost since 1981. But while Escape from New York was able to make back its budget, grossing $25.2 million, Escape from LA was a failure at the box office only raking in $42.3 million, which is $25,477,365 in the US, and $16.8 million internationally, meaning that it really needed at least $30 million extra dollars just to make some kind of a profit. It didn't get great reviews either, with Todd McCarthy of Variety writing, a cartoonish, cheesy, and surprisingly campy apocalyptic actioner, John Carpenter's Escape from L.A. is spiked with a number of funny and archaic anarchic ideas, but doesn't begin to pull them together into a coherent whole. Stephen Holden of the New York Times also wasn't a fan, stating that anything the film was trying to potentially satirize and was a desperate attempt to hold together a mediocre spoof that pales in comparison to the original. It did, however, have some fans at the time, with Roger Eber giving it three, out of, three and a half out of a possible four stars, even stating that it was poking fun at the action genre while exploiting it. Kevin Thomas of the LA Times wrote that it managed to balance both humor and action, and Peter Stack of the San Francisco Chronicle gave it 3 out of 4 stars, calling it dark, percussive, and perversely fun. In recent years, the film has gotten a cult following, with Alan Zilberman of the, of the Atlantic commenting on the film in a 2013 retrospective comparing how the then-futuristic elements contrasted with what really happened in 2013, saying that Snake would find our fascination with technology annoying, calling the ending of the movie profound. In retrospect, this is what John Carpenter felt about the film. Escape from L.A. is better than the first movie, ten times better. It's got more to it. It's more mature. It's got a lot more to it. I think some people didn't like it because they felt it was a remake, not a sequel. I suppose it's the old question of whether you like Rio Bravo or El Dorado better. They're essentially the same movie. They both had their strengths and weaknesses. I don't know... You never know why a movie is going to make it or not. People didn't want to see Escape at, the t at that time, but they really didn't want to see the thing. You just wait. You've got to give me a while. People will say, you know, what was wrong with me? He later reiterated this point. It is a better movie. It didn't do what the first one did for some reason. Maybe it was too dark, too nihilistic. I don't know. They didn't dig it as much as the first one. It did okay, but it just wasn't, just wasn't a hit. 
And when, when it comes to the cult following, Carpenter said, I'm just delighted that it's gaining that popularity. I really dig Escape from LA and always have. And I always have, I have to say. But even with this cult success, Snake really hasn't been seen anywhere since 1996, including a video game tie-in for Escape from LA, meant for a release around that same time for the PlayStation, Sega Saturn, Panasonic M2, shell, and PC that got canceled for unknown reasons. And that's just around that film's release, as there was a potential sequel called Escape from Earth, which, with the idea being that Earth was the last place for Snake to make his escape, with a lot of special effects and Snake flying around in a space capsule, but this never happened because of Escape from LA's financial disappointment. In fact, minus the Snake Plissken Chronicle series of comics, all attempts to bring Snake into a new project have either been cancelled or have stalled. There was an attempt by Namco to create a, snake, create a video game based on the Snake Plissken character, meant for a release in 2005, but this ended up being scrapped. There were plans for a TV show based on Escape from New York, but 9-11 put a kibosh on those plans, Outlaw star Mitsuru Hongo and Production IG attempted to create an anime that supposedly took from the Escape from Earth concept with Carpenter and Kurt Russell, but that was also shelved, and there was even a rumor that Ghosts of Mars was originally a Snake Plissken project, but when Escape from LA failed, Snake ended up being replaced by Ice Cube's Desolation Williams, and Carpenter has said that this was not the case. And then there's the potential remake of Escape from New York, something that started in 2007 with New Line Cinema, with Gerard Butler being considered for Snake, Ken Nolan of Black Hawk Down fame on screenplay duty, and Neil H. Moritz, producer credits here, producing through his company original film, with Underworld and Live Free or Die Hard director Len Weissman as director, only to be replaced by the now disgraced Brett Ratner of Rush Hour and Red Dragon, then the dude who directed the 2010 remake of The Crazies got involved as director with the guy who wrote the screenplays for Luca Guadagino's films along with the writer for 21, only for a new line to then drop the remake entirely in 2011. Then four years later, 20th Century Fox got involved with Robert Rodriguez, then getting the involvement of Lee Wanell, who wrote the screenplays for Saw and Insidious, plus directed Upgrade and the 2020 version of The Invisible Man, and Neil Cross, creator of Luther. And now, Radio Silence, the group behind Ready or Not, the most recent Scream films, and the recently released Abigail are now involved. And supposedly it's a sequel, not a remake. Which only time will tell if this ever materializes, or if it ends up just being another scrapped concept that never sees the light of day. Yeah, Snake has had a rough go since 1996, and at this point, the only way the man is ever going to return is if I write some draft where Ash Ketchum is trapped in a space station trying to find his love interest and fighting for his life against numerous criminals who have invaded the, space, the station and intend to destroy the planet Earth. All while Snake tags along, commenting on the situation while following his own path, and even then the likely chances of that getting off the ground aren't the highest. I don't even have a first draft. I'd be better off trying to convince Nintendo Capri Sun and Dolly Paka to participate in Metal Jesus Rocks' I Hate You series in what would probably be the first episode since 2017, complete with Dick Move, Drunk Master Paul's Alter Ego, The Immortal John Hancock, Patchy the Pirate, multiple in the bathrooms, explosions, and a shoehorn. Shoehorn? Why don't you give me a foot rub while you're down there? <laughs> All right, and me jam rocks! What? Yeah, this got a little off the rails. So let's end this thing. I'll be quite honest. When I decided to 
finally review Escape from L.A., I kind of went into the mindset of it's not going to be as good as what came before. And that's sort of the same mindset that I'm probably going to have if I ever decide to review Batman Forever. It's certainly going to be an enjoyable film, but it's not as good as what came before. It'll be fun, but it's not what came out previously. And that's how I felt with Escape from L.A. So I wasn't really disappointed, but no matter how you slice it, that's kind of... It shows. It pretty much shows. Kurt Russell is still awesome as St. Fliskin, and it's most of the cast. There is some... You can definitely tell that they were using the most of the $50 million budget that they were given. There is some good cinematography. There are some fun little grindhouse tongue-in-cheek moments that are pretty entertaining. And the soundtrack freaking rocks. But the tone is very off-putting and a bit of a mixed bag for me. Both as someone who really enjoyed the tone and sort of dark nature of Escape from New York. And the CGI is bad. Like, there is... It's not good. And it's really just... It's fun for a laugh and sort of like grindhouse value, but... It's still bad. And really... This whole film isn't bad. But this sort of stuff just brings it down for me. It's not as good as the original film. Nevertheless, I do recommend that you seek it out, whether you're a fan of Escape from New York, whether you're a John Carpenter fan, or you like tongue-in-cheek grindhouse films. Like, I tend to think. So, if you want your copy of it, there is a DVD available for it, although I should mention that this is a, this is not 16x9 enhanced for widescreen televisions, like that baby right there, Instead, it's a 4x3 letterbox transfer, meaning it's not anamorphic. So if you try playing on that TV right there, it will probably shrink the image, and you'll probably most likely need to use like a zoom feature with either your Blu-ray player or your video game console with a disk drive or even your TV itself in order to enhance the image. So there is something to keep in mind with that. But there is a DVD available for it, and if you got like an old 4x3 CRT TV, like an old square shaped TV like this, it's not an issue really. But if you're playing on that type of TV, it's going to shrink the image. But at the same time, there is also a Blu-ray for that film, courtesy of the one and only Screen Factory. That is 16x9, enhanced for widescreen televisions, like that. And it also comes with some little extras as well. Like, all this has is a theatrical trailer and that's it. At least that one has like a commentary and some interviews. So, there, there are options. Whether you decide to pick up the DVD or you decide to pick it up on Blu-ray. So, yeah. And so with that, this has been my review for Escape from L.A. I hope you enjoyed it, found it entertaining and educational. And maybe it made you want to seek out this movie, even if you felt that I was a little disappointed by the movie, or that my expectations were a little too high. Which, I don't think they were all that high, but who knows, I'm just a guy that looks like a stoner. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really feel like doing this review, but now I've done it, and I'm glad I did. And so, with that, I will catch you later. Take care, everyone.
was Pliskin. 